Hi guys and gals, this is Kiki and welcome to Association Chat. What is the bad word in associations? On this episode of Association Chat, I had the chance to interview Wes Troquel, a technology consultant known in the association industry for his foresight and expertise. He leads organizations through massive change and I think you're going to enjoy it. I hope you enjoy this episode of Association Chat. Welcome to this week's Association Chat, your weekly online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with the topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm your host, Kiki Latalien, CEO of Amplified Growth Digital Marketing and host of this weekly chat that's been around, can you believe it, since 2009 on Twitter, Blab, and now Huzzah or Huzzah. So this week we have Wes Troquel, who is the president of Effective Database Management. And for years I've known Wes by his reputation, stellar reputation, and work as an experienced, highly effective consultant in database management from vendor selections to actually getting into the data and helping that, helping association executives to inform their decisions on uh, what they're doing for their associations. But Wes is also widely respected for his consistent thought leadership about association organizational strategy. And so today we're talking with him about a topic that many people in this industry feel uncomfortable with. And that's why today's discussion is called the bad word in associations why you need to rethink sales. <laughs> so welcome, Wes. Thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. All right. So uh, it seems that sales used to be a dirty word in association management, but it's changing. And so what has brought about all of this change? Well, uh, that's a good question. I think um, I spent uh, almost 10 years in associations as a director of membership and marketing and customer service and last 17 years as a consultant to associations. And over that time, I've seen, um, I'll call it a softening towards, towards <laughs> the idea of sales, um, to the use of the word sales, for example. Um, there was a time not too long ago where sales only applied to exhibit sales, to advertising sales, mm -hmm. and, so was, and you know, product sales. So you could sell those things, but um, you know, the idea of selling membership or the idea of you know upselling, cross-selling um, things related to membership, or or just the product services that the association had, I, I at least in my experience that was always kind of frowned upon. The idea, I guess, was that it was self-evident what the value of the membership was, and therefore we didn't need to sell anything; we just needed to inform. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm finding now is a lot more associations are actually um, systematizing sales. And so that sales run across the, the, the gamut from uh, membership sales. And so, for example, I've got several clients who actually have incentive programs in place for their membership staff when they uh, uh, prospect and sell membership. And, uh, and then you know, across, across the board in terms of upselling event registrations, for example, someone uh, registers for an event and then the association contacts and says, you know, we saw you're interested in this, you might consider this program as well. And again, these are the kind of things that five years ago were rare and 10 years ago just never happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, and I think that there is sort of this mindset that even if it's softening today, I think that just the terminology, I think that a lot of people um, not just hesitate, but really they, they bristle at the idea mm -hmm. of taking sales on. Although I think that we have to start thinking about it and 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 get over that um so that we can do what we need to do to make our our organizations better and stronger and so you know should all associations have a sales focus or is it just for some how do you, how do you determine that i think that um 
probably all associations should have some type of sales focus. And then obviously it depends on what your product and service mix looks like. And so, for example, I'm working with a client right now that's a small trade association. And literally, they have one event per year. They have, um, well, in fact, they just started a newsletter, even though it's a 50-year-old organization. They have no, no other events. They sell membership. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, they, but um, they just don't have anything to sell. And so other than membership, and funny enough, their membership is so restricted that they know they have 10 members and they know of the four other companies that could be members. And that is their entire world. Wow. So for them, for the, yeah, for them, a sales focus probably isn't necessary. They have different things they need to focus on. But for a lot of associations, you know, selling membership, the membership is broad enough and the market is broad enough, the universe is broad enough that they should focus more on um, a consistent systematized approach to selling as opposed to you know, just shotgun or hoping that people will show up in the door. And then again, looking at the products and services mix, if you've got uh, multiple products, multiple events, um, multiple services that you can talk to your members about and your customers about, then I think that calls for again systematizing sales so that it isn't just haphazard or done one off for each event or each service. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm wondering, so when organizations are looking at this, and I know, I actually know a couple of people who are on the chat today who are um, exploring uh, having a more sales focused approach, where do they begin? Where do organizations begin with that? Right. I think the most important place to start is, again, with the product services mix. Mm -hmm. You have to really just catalog what you can sell, what you have to sell. So again, an extreme example, uh, one trade association I worked for as a, as a membership and marketing person 100 years ago, um, they had a trade show, and um, I think that was it. <laughs> they, 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 you know, and so membership was related to the trade show. Everyone wanted to exhibit at the trade show, and it really was all about the trade show. And so there wasn't much more there to sell. And there was a woman there who managed the sales of the exhibits, and she did that, and we did a bunch of marketing and PR related to that. But there just wasn't much for us to sell. So I could look at that uh, products and services mix and say, okay, here, here's the one thing, two things we sell. Let's just make sure that we have processes in place to sell that. Mm -hmm. And if the mix, if the basket is bigger, then we have to start talking about, okay, how are these things related? Um, how can we cross sell? How can we upsell? How can we co-market and so on? And so the, so the first step I think is understanding what you have to sell. And then related to that, I guess I would just add, um, if you've got this basket, are there any obvious add-ons to that? So what mm -hmm. I mean by that is, is there, are there other products and services that we could easily develop? And one of my favorites, Kiki, that again, that I'm seeing more associations do, I think it's awesome, and it, it lends itself to this whole question, is um, custom, I'll just call it customized consulting from the association. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the association has expertise and the members want that expertise, and so the association, they, they, they feed that expertise through you know, newsletters, magazines, events, and so on, the, the standard stuff. But what a lot of companies are now saying is, we want you to come in and customize it for us and presented to us your content related to our business. And so, and the companies are willing to pay a premium for that. So why not sell those consulting services or maybe it's, you know, private labeled events or whatever you want to call it. But that's an opportunity where you look at your, uh, your mix, your basket of um, products and services, and you say, you know, what can we add under that's kind of low cost, but high added value. You know, that's a that's a really interesting idea too, because I don't know that um, a lot of organizations sit and, and do that on a maybe an annual basis and really go through and think through, okay, here here is what we're selling. Here are these different and, and the different categories. And how can we build off of that and look at looking at it from a sales perspective? I will say that um, you know, somewhat related, in a few weeks, I'm going to have an interesting discussion about education for associations and um, how associations, how most associations should be looking at education and uh, training if they're not already as being something that would be a focus for, for sales, you know? And so it, it is interesting to look at this. So when people, when organizations do 
uh, go through this sort of audit of what they have to sell. Um, what what happens next? So say that they've they've made this audit um, and they've gone through and they've identified areas where they either already have things that they're ready to go with and they just need to amplify what they're doing or or optimize what they're doing um, or they know where they need to develop. What happens after that? So I think the next step, if I were advising them, is to say, okay, look at each of those products and services, look at your mix, and what is your universe like in terms of who you can sell that to? Because again, that's the next step in being realistic about how far do we need to go to develop a real systematic process for selling this versus there's only five people in the world who are going to buy this, so we know pick up the phone and talk to them. That's how we're <laughs> going to sell. That's how we're going to sell that. But uh, just as an example, a group I'm working with right now, their membership is it's a trade association. Membership is about seven hundred, but they know their universe is six thousand, so they have just a little over ten percent market penetration and. Now, they also know that they can't get 100% because there's a very uh, big portion of those 6,000 that are so small that they really can't afford the dues or can't really can't service them. So again, they've identified the universe and they say, we've got probably 2,000 additional organizations who could and should be members. And so again, they've identified the product, identified the universe, and now they talk about, um, okay, what's the process for uh, approaching them and what is our sales process for that? So in their case, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, one of the things they do is when uh, they've incentivized their staff. So when staff is talking to these non-members for any reason, they can see in their database, oh, they're a non-member and they say, have you guys thought about membership? Here's what's entailed. And, ah, uh, yeah. and then yeah. that staff member can, you know, if they bring them in as a member, the staff member gets a little spit for themselves. So then they, I mean, this, this ties into what you're doing for your inbound marketing, when you're talking about the customer journey and, um, you know, all along, all along the way, what you can be doing to, to communicate better with um, your, your current audience and your intended audience. <laughs> and uh, so, so how about technology? Um, you know all about databases, you know how this is tied to that. Um, how, so how, how should we start thinking about technology with that sort of sales focus? Yeah, that's, it. that's that's the right question to ask from my perspective, um, and, and that's and that's part of why I started paying attention to this really pretty long ago already. Because if you have a high volume, you know, like again using that example, if you have two thousand, that's that's a high volume of uh, companies and prospects to keep track of. It's not twenty, and so uh, having technology, you know, just a spreadsheet is technology. You have a spreadsheet that gives me all those two thousand and the stuff I've talked to them about. That's kind of the first step is just understanding. Um, the communications, the interactions we're having with them. The beauty of today's technology is that um, most association management software systems now understand that there's a CRM, a customer relationship management aspect to really everything we do. Mm -hmm. And that can then lead to the Salesforce piece of stuff. When I say Salesforce, I mean um, the idea, not the product. The mm -hmm. idea that, there, that there's a sales process involved. And so then there are products that are built on Salesforce, products that are built on Microsoft CRM that are really designed to leverage the technology to allow you to go through this sales process. And so what I mean by sales process is the idea, the traditional idea of prospect, uh, lead, um, warm lead or cold lead, hot lead discussions, and then win or lose the, the sale. And mm -hmm. so you can, uh, they, you know, they, the sales people call it a sales funnel. I've got this big 2,000 people or 2,000 companies I'm talking to, I'm gonna narrow that down uh, slowly early into people that are really hot prospects and the technology allows me to keep track of where everybody is in the funnel keep track of um, when staff is talking to them and so on one of my favorite examples is a group that i worked with a couple years ago where it was a small organization um 12 or 14 staff but they had three distinct staff members selling different things to the same universe and that's not unheard of. So there was one person who was in charge of exhibits. There was a separate person in charge of uh, sponsorships and a third person in charge of advertising. Mm -hmm. But as it happens, there was probably 80% or more overlap between their buyers in terms of the company buying. But wow. there, may or, yeah, there may or may not have been overlap in terms of the actual person. Yeah. So Kiki and, Kiki and West are at the same company. I'm buying the exhibits, you're buying the advertising, but it's the same company buying both. Uh -huh. and, what they, and what they discovered, of course, was that Every now and then, it wasn't terrible, but it was enough to get their attention. Kiki would say, 
you know, you just talked to Wes yesterday about the other stuff. Why didn't you ask him about this? Why yeah, are you calling me back? Seems so disjointed. Right? Precisely, and and then that all leads to a uh, I'll call it a discomfort on the part of the customer. They start saying, you know, yeah. these guys, yeah, they don't know, they don't have their act together, and I'm going to give them money, and that makes me nervous because they don't really know what's going on inside. Especially if they know they only have ten staff, how can they not know what's going on? Right. And so, right. And so this group was again smart enough to get technology that allowed them to continue doing the way they were doing it in terms of sales, but having it all in one place. So that when Wes went to call Kiki, I would pull up your record, but I would also see all the other contacts that my association has had with Kiki's company. So it wasn't necessarily with Kiki, but and in fact, uh, twice they had said to me, they had situations where they would call Kiki and Kiki would say, you know, Wes called me yesterday and now you're calling me today. So there's two, two staff people calling the same person. That's oh, even worse. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so they, and so they, again, they implemented this technology in this process. And now again, when Wes picks up, the, before he picks up the phone, he looks at the database, he knows what conversations have been, and now he's uh, educated. He's intelligent about how he's approaching. He may not, in fact, he may not call key because he might go to this other staff person and say, did you talk about this stuff? Yeah. Is it, you know, is it safe for me to call Kiki now or do I need to wait? <laughs> do I need to wait? Give her a little space. Yeah, give her a little yeah. space. Exactly. So, so I always like to, um, especially when I'm talking to someone like yourself who you're working with organizations of all sizes and they're trying to solve, they're trying to solve these, these very similar problems sometimes, but it's a different sort of timeline and, and budget for like when they can attack, attack right. things. So I like to ask questions like about low hanging fruit. You know, I like to, I like to look at what are some things that somebody who's listening today, uh, an association executive listening today, um, can learn from you about ways that they can go and they can immediately improve their situation. So in thinking about sales, you know, what can they do with the, with the system they have in place um, based on your experience that you see is like, this is a pretty simple thing that right out of the gate, you're going to get benefit from. Is there anything right. like that? Yeah, I think so. I think one of the things is going back to what we just said in terms of the foundational stuff, understanding what your product mix is mm -hmm. um, and understanding who that can be sold to. And then the third, the third thing would be understanding who in the organization is actually doing that selling, if anybody. Mm. So, so mm -hmm. you know, we've got this list of things that we sell. Is anybody responsible for selling them or do, does it just happen passively? Yeah. And, oh, that's, that, big. that's yeah. big. It's, it's okay <laughs> if it is happening passively, but you have to acknowledge that and say, yeah, no one's actively selling this. Yeah. So if we want to actively sell it, then what is the next step? And, and if we do find that people are responsible for it, then we start asking the question, okay, how does that, you know, so let's say Wes and Kiki are responsible for selling two different things. We know that. Mm -hmm. So now we need to talk about, okay, what is Wes's process? What is Kiki's process? How can we actually get them to work together again so we don't have these cross purposes? We're not wasting time and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, what if you do find out? What if you go and you're like, oh, no. I mean, I can tell you now. That is very passive because there's no one that right. is, you know, actively responsible for anyone and, and, for any of this. And I can see that. I can. I can really. I mean, you know, from working in different associations yeah. myself, I, I know that there's most definitely that happening out there. Um, what are what? How, what would you say to them at that point? Well, the first thing you have to say is, do you want to actively? do this. Yeah. I mean, they have to, they, you know, there, um, there's a, there's a book, uh, I forget who it's by David Meister or someone It's called you gotta wanna, which is that <laughs> you can, you can train people, but you yeah. training doesn't, training doesn't give motivation that only comes from inside. And yeah, so yeah. for the association, they've got to want to sell stuff. If they don't want to, if, if passive is good enough, that's okay. We can move on and we don't need to worry about that. Anymore. Mm -hmm. But if they really believe they need to start actively selling stuff, then that they, they have to identify it. Is anything being actively sold? And then what I would say is if they really found that they had this list, they had this basket, but it had nothing being done actively, I would look, you mentioned low hanging fruit. I would look at the stuff that is selling the best and yeah. find out why, and then see if there's a universe for selling more of that. And, that, yeah. and for associations, I think that's really important because uh, again, I worked in an association as a membership director. I always like to say we had 99.7% retention. 
we had a universe of 3,000 colleges and we had all but three. And the, wow. three, who wouldn't, the three who wouldn't be members um, were, would not be members because of the president of the association at the time. So it was something personal. <laughs> so it was a personal thing and that had nothing to do with, wow. But I can't take, as the membership director, I could take zero credit for any of that because this association could be on autopilot. The members would always join because yeah. they believed it, they believed in the cause, they were gonna support it. So there's no universe left there, there's nothing left to sell. So I, we, we, had to, we finally did acknowledge, there's nothing left to do other than to just keep them happy. Mm -hmm. So, that, so that, that sets membership aside. But at that same organization, they had plenty of other products and services that these members could buy and did buy. And so that's where I would then say, okay, where's the universe for, right? in their case, they were selling, um, for example, a, uh, a research study that was pretty expensive and very time intensive for the uh, colleges to do, but it had huge value. So I could have made an argument, there is an opportunity because we have 3000 members, 80% mm -hmm. of them probably could benefit from this and could afford it, but only I think less than 1% were actually taking advantage of it. Yeah. And so there was a, to me a huge opportunity. And so now we need to talk about, okay, what's the message? How do we sell it? And then ideally, what is the sales process? How do we communicate it out? How do we follow up? Who is responsible? Are there incentives involved? You know, the whole bit. But, that, but the organization would have to acknowledge first, we believe we can sell this and we want to sell this. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's something. Um, okay, so AMS Fest is happening in DC this week. And, um, and I believe that Terry Carden of Review My AMS is landing in DC today and uh, getting getting excited and everybody who is anybody in the AMS world is going to be coming together around this. And I know you are and and uh, so you'll be there too. I will be. Um, as we are looking at the way that technology can support some uh, sales initiatives in uh, different organizations, how do the AMSs play a role? What are they doing to support associations right now in this endeavor? And then I, I have a follow-up question, but go go with that. <laughs> okay. Well, so I, as I mentioned earlier, there are there are a handful of vendors now who are built on Microsoft CRM and or Salesforce. And um, Salesforce, for example, and Microsoft CRM, they both have Salesforce automation tools. So from a technology perspective, there are tremendous opportunities there. Um, you mentioned inbound marketing as an example. Uh, several of the AMS vendors have started to integrate to inbound marketing tools like HubSpot or Marketo. And those, you know, again, that's a, another subject completely. It's a huge thing. But all of this comes back to, um, again, making sure that you understand what you want to be able to do, what your university is, what your offer is, and then the technology can support that. And so I think, so those AMS vendors who are built on Salesforce and CRM, natively they've got that help. Um, other AMS vendors have actually done some integrations to Salesforce. So you can use Salesforce as your sales tool and then use the AMS for everything else and have those two talk to each other. So several vendors have done that. And then um, I'd say, you know, a handful of vendors have thought this through enough where they've built their own tools. So you could, you could have, I, I call it a, um, uh, a simpler low cost, you know, kind of Salesforce approach where you can at least track your track your prospects, track your track your uh, sales funnel, um, even track who the um, sales rep is. So if this person closes a deal and West gets the credit, those kind of things. So some of the vendors have done that as well. So the vendors are starting to think about that. The vendors always follow the market for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. and up to this point, the, the market hasn't really been demanding these tools much. But that, like I said, I think that's starting to change. Yeah. Yeah. So if you had to look into your crystal ball and, you know, imagine, I see it. Is there one in the background there? Um, and, and you had to imagine, um, you know, what the, what the next five years looks like in regards to how associations view sales. Um, what would, what would you imagine the future being there? Um, I think, First is that more of them will just acknowledge that they need a process in place. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll say, you know, we've got to, as we we're talking about earlier, the passive versus the active. That we need to be more active. Um, again, there's going to be rare exceptions. They're going to be um, trade associations and some professional societies who have, for example, certification, the golden handcuffs. They're going to be that smaller portion of groups that 
they just don't have to do anything. They only need to exist and continue to produce good educational content and they'll be fine. But um, I think the majority of associations, again, because they've become so specialized, they're going to have to really think about how they do sales, how they manage sales, um, what the universe looks like, what the product mix looks like, and so on. And so I think more and more associations are going to um, start seeing this. But I, I, you know, I don't, I don't like it when the pundits say they'll do this or they'll die because associations very rarely die. It just doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah. But they won't grow. Um, as fast as they could, and they won't have as much impact, and they won't carry out their mission as, as dramatically as they could if they start focusing on this stuff. I see, I see. So, okay, and I, I wanna turn this to those of you who are watching, and, and I'm thankful for all of you out there. Do you have questions? Do you, what what is it that is um, challenging you right now when it comes to thinking about sales for associations? Is there something that in particular you're struggling with or is there something that, you know, you know that there's a direction that you need to move in and you for some reason can't go in that direction? Um, would love to hear your thoughts or your questions. Uh, in the meantime, my follow-up question to you about uh, the AMS, uh, the, how the AMS providers are working with associations in this regard is really, um, you know, you hear a lot of stuff that's going on in the industry. You know some of the things that they're working on. And like you were mentioning before, they do follow, um, you know, the market trends and, and what people are asking for, what they hear their clients asking for a lot. But there's this dance that they do, and um, it's really how much do they want to develop in this one area when they could focus more on integration. And so... So, I mean, what do you have any ideas on any thoughts on this? Are there any trends that you've noticed? I mean, how far into, you know, into this space do you think that they're going to go with providing some kind of rudimentary solution that people can start employing when it comes to sales? Yeah, it's a good question. I, th I think ultimately they have uh, two options, really. Well, I suppose three options, the third being they don't have to do anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, that's good the, enough. Yeah, exactly. The two options I see is, is kind of just building out what they have um, and working with their clients to do that. So understanding what the sales process needs to be. I mean, I will say that associations in general, they don't need as intensive uh, a tool as something like Salesforce mm -hmm. overall. I mean, you know, because it's not like um, the average association is selling a thousand things and has a thousand sales reps selling those things. So again, for the average association, uh, the big powerful tools aren't necessary, but the uh, AMS vendors, I think, still need to improve their tools. And so I think that's one path is they'll improve their tools and they'll work with their clients to determine what those what that looks like. And, and I've seen this, uh, especially in the higher end uh, products where you're seeing, again, sales funnel, uh, sales management, sales territory management, um, keep track of incentives and the whole bit. Um, so, so that's one approach. And then the second approach, of course, is integration to sales tools like Salesforce. Um, that Salesforce integration idea has been around for a long time. It's basically as long as Salesforce has existed. Um, and, but I'm curious to see, I don't have a prediction on this, what's going to happen as we see more vendors build on top of Salesforce as opposed to just integrating to Salesforce. Mm -hmm. So it's really the, it's the uh, legacy systems, proprietary systems versus uh, the Salesforce and Microsoft Zero platform-based systems. Got it. And, and so when people, when, so when, I, and this is, this is just me not knowing, but um, when do people start bringing in like you, like when, when do people go and they say, I need this, your expertise and I need it at this juncture, when is right. the right time? That is a great question. I think, um, <laughs> all the time, <laughs> <laughs> obviously the, I would say, I would say if, if, um, it's really kind of one of three things, if you're struggling with the technology itself, in mm -hmm. other words, um, you, you feel like the technology is not supporting what you need to do that's one time to call for help because um, you know someone like me knows the market, knows what's available. And also frankly knows if you've got an existing system that's an off the shelf AMS, um, I know about what the system can do in this realm. And so mm -hmm. there's potential there where I could say, oh yeah, that system you had, here's what you need to do to make that work. So so that's one route is just 
the technology itself, do you feel like that's holding you back? The right. second thing is, if uh, like you mentioned earlier, if you, if you don't know where to begin, or as you look at this, it's kind of overwhelming in terms of, okay, what do we do next? Then that's, again, a time where you get outside help to say, uh, come in and say, what does your foundation look like? What are you guys working on now? Where are the opportunities? And um, in my case, you know, I can help them chart that all out, including strategy for how you implement a sales team and a sales process. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the, the third really is um, for those few that already have it in place, if they feel like it's not optimized, then that's an opportunity also to call an expert to say, okay, here's what we're doing. This works. We still feel like we can leverage more here. In fact, I'm working with a, a client right now doing exactly that. I've told them that they actually do a lot of sales stuff really, really well. And they were even joking with me. I had written an article, I think last month, that said 80% is good enough. And when they got that article, they said, oh, well, we don't need Wes's help because we're already at 80%. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. Um, and they are. They're doing very well. But they also realize that they've got opportunities and they yeah. wanted me to help them kind of um, expose those. Because one, one of the, and I think, Kiki, you know this, of course, having done it yourself, the one of the values of bringing an outside expert is that a they generally they have no dog in the hunt so they right. so what they find is what they find they don't they don't have any biases in that respect and they bring obviously outside expertise so the experience that other associations have had I can bring that to you and then the third one really is that um, completely fresh set of eyes and yeah. I can't tell you you know in 17 years of consulting how many times I've had clients say to me I never thought about that and my in my head I don't say it out loud is I can't believe you didn't see that. Uh, yeah, and it, yeah. And it's, it's just because they're, they're for the trees. They're in there. Yeah. And I mean, that happens to all of us, though. You know, I, I really I think you can't help it when you're so close to something that um, that a lot of times you, you can't see the forest for the trees. And so bringing in that outside help can definitely can definitely help you to to expand and grow. So um, if I had to ask you for any sort of uh, final words uh, that that people should remember when they're thinking about jumping into this, or something that they uh, should walk away from this, um, and really, really remember when it comes to sales and associations. What is it? And I know I'm putting you on the spot with this. But. No, that's right. Uh, well, I, so I was thinking as we were talking earlier. Um, Dan Pink wrote a book a couple years ago. I think it's called "To Sell Is Human," mm -hmm. and his really his point of his book was that we all do sales all the time, whether or not we call it that. And that's, you know, that's in your private life. When you're trying to convince someone to do something that you're selling and in your, obviously in your professional life, if you're trying to convince someone to attend an event, even to serve on a committee, if you're trying to get someone to volunteer, that is selling. And so I think, you know, the, the first thing I would take away is, you know, we facetiously titled this the bad word of association. <laughs> but I think that's the first step is we've got to, we've got to get over that idea that selling is bad. Mm -hmm. and acknowledge that selling is necessary. So that's that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that um, we need to look at what our products and services mix is and, and acknowledge um, whether or not we're s selling it actively or passively. And if we want to actively sell it, are we doing it? And if, we're, and if we are, if we want to actively do it and we are doing it, are we doing it well? Yeah. And if we kind of answer those questions and then you can decide, okay, do we need to do more about this or are we good where we are? Yeah, I, I really do think that your point about uh, about getting comfortable with selling, and I, I think it was absolutely perfectly titled. Actually, not only not only was this, um, it is the bad word. I mean, people are afraid of the word sales. I I am afraid of the word sales, and for years, I um, I just recoiled whenever anybody would say anything about you know with. Oh well, you'd be good in sales or something like that. And I just, <laughs> what does that mean? And I hate that. And I just, if you, you don't want to be the sleazy car salesman, you know, you don't want to, yes, you don't yes. want to be like that. And no offense to any car salesman who might be listening, because I'm, you know, I think I went to school with some. But, but, uh, but seriously, like I had to get comfortable with it. And when you stop thinking about it in terms of trying to push something onto somebody. But you really start thinking about it in terms of how are we providing value? How am I providing yes. value to whomever it is that I'm I'm working with or speaking to? Then it becomes a whole different dynamic. It becomes a whole different mm -hmm. story. And it's really if we are trying to 
do the best by our members or our potential members or really anyone we're trying to do business with, then we need to get comfortable with selling. We need to get comfortable with this concept because it's really how can we provide the very best value that we can to the people that we're talking to, the people we're working with, the organizations we're working with. And that's a really serious, that's a, that's a very serious topic and something that deserves a lot of attention and not just sort of a knee jerk, like, ah, that's not us, you know? Totally agree. I worked with a group uh, last year and a trade association. Uh, we were working on, we were working on just process in general and data management, but part of that was the, this whole sales concept. And one of the things that struck me and I said it to them was that they really struggled with pricing and mm -hmm. sales. And it was because, uh, as I put it, I said they didn't have the courage of their convictions. They really believed that they had value, but when it came time to talk to their members about it, they were really reticent. They just felt they kept saying, we're selling this, we're pushing this. I said, well, you either believe it's got value or it doesn't. If it doesn't have value, you're right, you're pushing. But if it does have value, you're helping. And so they needed to culturally change their mindset to say, yes, um, this has value, and when the when the member pays us a thousand dollars for that, they're getting ten thousand dollars worth of value from us. And mm -hmm. they, you know, if you talk to them one on one, they all really believe that. But as a group, they were just really uncomfortable with setting pricing, for, you know, forcing their members to actually pay those kind of things. Which, uh, you know, always, I get it because I've been there, but it always struck me as odd. It's like, you know, you, I can tell you believe this, so why wouldn't you ask someone to? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, yes. And that's the thing is that, and I see, I want to say Keith Chamberlain from the Red Crew over here, he says sales equals solves problem. If you have this, then sales is far from a scary word. And then Christine, I'm glad to see you on here, Christine. Sales, I, I, she, she says regarding sales, I totally agree. It's not a well-regarded word, but we all do it to keep our organizations alive. And then I think it's Helen from Team Sliceworks. Um, she's agreeing with with Keith and saying, "Yeah, great point." And it's so true because it, it's it, we are doing a disservice by not actually looking at the the ways that we can help people or help organizations through the the services, the benefits, the products that that we provide. And so why would we make it more complicated? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. why wouldn't we make it if we do believe in what we're doing, if we do believe in what we are in fact selling, then why aren't we exploring ways to make this as easy as possible for people to, to understand it better, to have a more enjoyable experience, to have better customer service? Why are we not looking at this the whole way through? And it's not enough to say, even if you're a nonprofit or, or even if you're, you know, a scientific organization and, and your focus is something totally different, it's not because we're, we are all selling something and we just have to believe in it and the quality of it, which I hope is, is the case mm -hmm. and then figure out how to do our very, our very best. And there are so many tools and the technology is there but it is complicated and if you're not approaching it with the idea that that sales is what is what it is then you're probably missing something along the way right yeah i think you have to uh, again my experience is most people who work at most nonprofits really believe in the in the product they believe in the mission and so that's the first step that's the key and so if you believe it if you believe you're delivering value then selling that value becomes less much less difficult because now you're improving the lives of other people, you're not selling them something.